Welcome to Recalculating Small Business. Like its award-winning book, Recalculating is dedicated to small business in America. Your hosts are Don Mazella and Dan Perkins. Don Mazella is the editor-in-chief of the Small Business Digest. Dan Perkins is a registered investment advisor with 43 years experience in managing money. Dan Perkins here, your co-host along with Don Mazella of Recalculating for Small Business. Our radio program is dedicated to you, helping the small business owners increase their profits. We draw our name from Recalculating, voted the best small business book of 2017 by the Independent Press. In this book, it features ways to grow your small business. Now, here's Don Mazzella. My co-host, Dan Perkins, is on assignment. But we have a really special guest today, Paul Jarvis. He's the author of, of a book that I think a lot of people uh, have, will have a great deal of interest in, The Company of One. Paul, welcome to the program. Yeah, thank you very much for having me on today. Well, uh, Paul, uh, before we go any further, tell us a little bit about your background and then a little bit about your book, and then we'll get into, and also, more importantly, your website for our audience, and then we'll go on. Sounds good. So I started working for myself in the 90s as a web designer around the time when the Internet was first starting to take off. So I started to do uh, basically design work for companies from Microsoft to Yahoo to Mercedes-Benz. And then I moved, I actually did a bunch of websites for professional athletes as well. And then finally, um, kind of the last group of people that I was working for before I stopped doing web design were online entrepreneurs like Danielle Laporte, Marie Forleo, Chris Carr, and probably about five or six years ago, I decided to move more into digital products. So online courses, podcasts, and software. And that's kind of where I've been at for the last little while, uh, which has accumulated into the writing of the book Company of One, which comes out January 15, 2019. And it'll be available at pretty much every major bookstore and on the internet. And the website for the book is ofone.co, so O-F-O-N-E dot C-O. But now what made you decide to write a book? Yeah, so at first it started with the idea that I was alone in thinking that I didn't want to grow my business even though it was successful. So I was doing really well as a web designer. I was booking anywhere from four to nine months in advance for clients. And other people in the business world were saying, hey, Paul, you you have enough work. You have enough people wanting to work with you. Why don't you build an agency? Why don't you grow this business into more than just you and hire designers and developers and project managers and administrators And you can have this big company making tons of money and it would be great. And I always thought, I don't, I don't necessarily want to do that. I actually like doing the work. I like doing the web design work. I like working with clients. I didn't want to be promoted out of the job that I liked. So I ended up not growing my business. And then I started to write about that a few years ago because I thought I was the only one and I, I'm now a writer. So I was writing that for my mailing list and, in a bunch of different publications online talking about how I didn't want to grow my business. And then I started to get inundated with people saying, Hey, I, I don't want that either. I feel, I felt like I was alone and I was raising my hand like, Oh, I thought I was the only one as well. And then when I realized there's this huge group of people who are more interested in making their business better instead of bigger, I was like, Hmm, th- this could definitely be a book. Well, well, that's enough to start, but, but, but what happened then? Well, I, I, had act, I have actually published uh, four other books, but I self-published those books. And when I had this idea that, hey, maybe I can write a book um, questioning the idea of growth in business, I figured, what if I tried to go the traditional publishing route? So I asked around to the people that I know if anybody knew a literary agent because I had heard that. was Honestly, I had no idea how 
writing a traditionally published book worked. So I asked a few of my author friends and they said, well, you need to get an agent. So I spoke to a few agents and then they, one of them said, yeah, this is a great idea. I really liked what she had to say. So we ended up writing a book proposal, which is about 60 pages. It's, it's, It's probably about a third the length of most books. But then that was what got uh, some publishers interested in the book. And then I ended up picking the publisher that seemed like they were the best fit for getting word out about this. Because it's kind of a counterintuitive idea, right? This idea that business success doesn't mean growth. So I wanted to make sure that I was finding um, kind of the right editor and the right publisher that would kind of keep the message uh, the way that I, I thought that it should be. And did you find the right, um, right the right person? Yeah, I did. I, I spoke to, uh, luckily enough, a few publishers were interested in the idea. And so I ended up choosing the publisher that, uh, the editor at the publisher that I most connected with. His name is Rick Wolf. He, and I also picked him because he has edited two of my favorite books uh, by Cal Newport, So Good They Can't Ignore You and Deep Work. Those are two of my favorite books. So when I found out that he was interested in my book, I was pretty excited by that. And then in talking to Rick uh, a bunch of times first, it definitely seemed like we, we were on the right page and he was, he was, he was, he was really good with the idea, um, this counterintuitive idea that growth isn't necessarily um, the most important thing. Okay, well, now we, we, we've gotten to what where you did it. Now, what's your book about, and what are the two or three things you, you t- tell people, the, the most important things? Yeah, so I think the book is really about this idea that growth in business isn't always beneficial. And I think in the news and in publications and that we're also focused with growth, and growth can definitely be, a good thing and growth completely makes sense in a lot of cases, but it doesn't always make sense. And I think that's the point of the book. The point of the book isn't to never grow or to literally just be a one person business. I don't even have a one person business. I have people that I work with all the time, but the the idea really is that if we start to question what growth makes sense for us and what growth doesn't make sense for us, then we're going to end up with the version of success that most aligns with what we actually want. Because I truly think that success isn't just doesn't have a single definition. I think everybody, and especially people that own their own business, they can define what success means to them. Sometimes it might mean more money. Sometimes it might mean that they have afternoons to spend with their young children. So I think that the idea of success is so personal that I think that the more that we can think about what we want in a business, especially if we're running the business, the more we can better get to that place. What are a couple of the other things your book talks about that um, our listeners should should know? Yeah, so I think a lot of what the book kind of gets into is the right questions to ask yourself for whether or not growth makes sense. And some of the questions, I can kind of go over a couple of the questions as well about that. So if you're thinking about growth in your business, then it's important to start to think about what enough is, because I think that there's kind of two sides to enough. There's the pre enough and there's the post enough. So pre enough, which is where we all start with our business when we start is, when we need to make enough for the business to be profitable, to have enough customers, to have enough revenue, to have enough um, sustainability and durability as a business. But where I think a lot of people don't start to think is when they've reached enough, then we can start to change our mindset to how can we optimize for enough? It's just like in working hours of the day. If I work six, seven hours a day, that's enough for me to get my work done. If I just kept working and worked 16 hours a day, I'm probably going to burn out. Like I can't work. I definitely can't work in my early 20s. I could work about 16 hours a day, but not for very long. So I think questioning what enough is and how much is enough and how will we know if we've reached enough and then what will change if we do reach enough. A couple other questions that we can ask ourselves uh, 
is does this growth just serve our ego? Because sometimes we want, so in business, if you start your own business, you need to have a little bit of ego because you think that you can do something better than the existing businesses out there, which is a good thing. And I don't think ego in that case is a bad thing. But where ego might not serve us is if we want to grow our business just so it looks better to other people. Say you're at a dinner party and somebody asks you what you do for a living. And if you answer, oh, I have a business with a thousand people, that could sound better in our minds than saying, oh, I have a business and I work from home. But I don't necessarily think that that's the case. I actually love working from home. <clears throat> and as well, I wouldn't want to be judged. I wouldn't want to go to a dinner party, for example, where people were just judging me by the number of employees that I had. Um, some of the other questions that we can ask ourselves for whether or not growth makes sense from the book Company of One are, um, does bigger or more or growth serve or help our existing customers? What are the maintenance costs of saying yes or building a new feature or product? How does growing affect our, our profit? Because sometimes more profit doesn't necessarily equal more revenue because sometimes when we start to make more, we have to spend more and it kind of can outpace that. And then the other final question, probably one of the most important questions to ask ourselves around whether growth makes sense is how does it affect our responsibilities and how we want to spend our day? So in the beginning, I was talking to you about how I really like doing web design. So I didn't want to become a manager of other web designers because that would change how I spent my day. That would change my responsibilities. That would change the, the type of work that I would be doing. And if we become a manager or a CEO, then the majority of our work isn't doing the actual thing in the business. It's managing other people and making decisions, which is right for a lot of people. There's a lot of people who are really, really good managers. But there's also a lot of people who don't necessarily want to be managers. And then they feel bad that they don't want to manage other people and then they think that their business can't be successful and the whole point of the book is that you can be successful even if you don't grow a, a massive business well you know i'd like to uh, explore that point a little bit further because uh, uh, uh i ran into someone uh saturday night at a, um, uh, an event Who's, uh, who said, you know, he'd been in business 30 years, and it was just he and two other employees, and they were all uh, pretty happy, and he didn't want to grow bigger than he was. Uh, you know, and I was sitting there saying, you know, maybe he he knew something I didn't know, because <laughs> we were always thinking of being, about uh, being bigger, and he just said, 30 years, I'm satisfied. I make a good living, um, and uh, my two uh, uh, employees have been with me, one for 21 years and the other one for 18. And, and I sat there and said, you know, maybe they, they have something. Would you like to comment on that? Yeah. So I, 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 so the first thing is it sounds like he's running a business uh, exactly like my book talks about. He's running a business where he's doing well and he's probably optimizing things like the way he deals with customers, the way he – launches or maintains products so he can keep it to three people. So in the book, I talk, um, I've interviewed a lot of people where they've, they've built companies that have grown in some regards, but not in others. And I think that's important. So a company like um, Need Want, they make cases for cell phones, like iPhones and uh, the Google phones. And the founder, uh, Marshall Haas, used to think that in order to build a business to the $10 million in revenue a year, he would have to hire teams and teams of people all sitting at desks in big offices. And what he's found is that the more that he optimizes the type of work that has to be done, the less people he needs to grow his business. So he does something, so he relies a lot on email automations, which I, I actually do as well. I really love email marketing and email automations because they allow you to communicate one to many. So I can send an email out to my mailing list of 30,000 people, and I don't have to write 30,000 different emails. I just have to write one. He also has a support staff who can show people where answers exist on their website currently, so they don't have to spend a lot of time on support. He's also built a product that requires almost no support. It's a great product. I've actually got his cell phone case on my phone right now. It doesn't actually need support because it's been so well made. So he found that he can grow his business to millions and millions of dollars in revenue 
only having a handful of people. And throughout the book, I, I've talked to tons of people who are kind of in the same place where they don't need to have a massive company with lots of employees, or even some people don't have lots of revenue, but they have enough revenue that they make it work for themselves and they make it work for their employees. And there's actually, to get kind of nerdy and scientific, I'll tell you a short story about um, there's a tendency in like the evolution of species that larger species grow, like the apex predator tends to grow bigger and bigger and bigger all the time. But then there's also a counterbalance tendency where extinction kills off larger species and not smaller species. And I feel like this thing, I feel like it's such a great analogy for business as well, because massive businesses tend to be very fragile. They rely on the winds of stockholders. They require a lot of resources. They have a lot of moving parts. So the most dominant creatures in, in nature tend to be huge, but the most enduring creatures tend to be smaller. So even in looking at things like an ant can fall from 15,000 times its height and walk around unharmed, and an elephant can't fall from, from double its height without being harmed. So it's interesting when you kind of look at a parallel there where um, size is basically associated with success, and then success is associated with hubris, and hubris is the beginning of the end of success. So I've kind of, the, the point of the book and the point of why I wrote Company of One was to kind of look at what happens if we don't grow when there's success? What happens if we don't hit that hubris and the hubris being the end of success? What if we just keep going at the size we're at and make things better instead of just bigger? Because I don't think bigger is better. I think better is better. And I think we've kind of got lost in that somehow. Wow. We, would you mind repeating that one? Because I, I haven't heard that one in quite that way, but I think it's so, so important, uh, bigger and hubris, et cetera. I just think that's such a great great line that I think it's worth repeating. Yeah, so success is associated with hubris. Hubris, or sorry, size is associated with success. I, I missed the first part. Size is associated with success. Success is associated with hubris. And hubris is the beginning of the end of success. I, I think that's such, such an important line. Um, I'm, I'm going to write it down uh, and uh, paste it up on my bulletin board because I think it's so important. We have just a couple of minutes left, um, Paul. Um, can you give us one other thought from your book for our, for our audience? So I think that it's important when we start out, when we start, even especially with a small business, it's apparent, it's, it's, it's important that we take small steps. I think a lot of us, especially when we're starting out, we want to have this big business that does all the things for all the people, but that can take a lot of time and it can even take a lot of money. I know a lot of people who have gone out of business basically before they started because they tried to spend too much to open their business. So I think a lot of what company one talks about is how to kind of go in smaller, more iterative steps. So if you want to start a business, what's the smallest step you can take that takes the least amount of time and the least amount of money? Because no business is ever stagnant, right? No business never changes. All businesses kind of shift and move at the whims of the market and of consumers. So I think when we're starting out, or even if we're going, what can we do that's really small to just make one little step, to make one little move forward towards making uh, a business? And even in my own business, like I started my business in, and I was, this is 20 odd years ago now, but I started my business with the computer that I already owned. Um, and I was 19, so still living at home with my parents. So I didn't even have an office when I started. But then as I started to make more money with my business, I bought a better computer. And then as I started to make more money, then I moved out of my parents' basement. And then I, I, I lived in my own place. And then I could have started, if it was a type of business that required a storefront, then I could have moved to having a storefront. And even if it's something, even if you're selling physical goods, you could start by selling those physical goods just on the internet without a brick and mortar location first. And then maybe if it grows big enough and you see there's enough local interest, then maybe you could open up a business that requires rent and 
um, electricity and water and, and all of that. So I think moving in the smallest step possible to move towards success is more important than just taking massive leaps, which are, which are inherently very risky, because you can end up spending a lot of money and a lot of time on those big leaps. So I think even, even with leaps, I think smaller is typically better where you're just working on moving the needle forward just a little bit and then keep going and then moving it forward just a little bit and then keep going from there. Because everything, like I've been in business 20 years and it's still, things still change. And I try not to make big changes all the time. I try to make the smallest change possible. So it's the least risky. We're talking with Paul Jarvis. He's the author of A Company of One. And, Paul, uh, your website again for everybody, because uh, unfortunately we've um, got a call of the day. No problem. So the website is ofone.co, so O-F-O-N-E dot C-O. Thank you so much. Uh, a link yeah, to no that problem. website will be on recalculating.biz tonight where you can hear this and every other past and future recalculating program. And you can also tell us if you you want someone to join us. Thank you. Paul Jarvis, thank you so much for being with us. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Thank you very much. Want to know more about health savings accounts for your company or yourself? Go to 2hsa.com and get a free employer's primer. Health savings accounts are a cost-effective way of offering health care benefits to your employees and yourself. HSAs build retirement funds for your employees, improve morale, and reduce your health care benefit costs. For a free employer guide to HSAs, go to 2hsa.com. That's 2hsa.com. Dan Perkins here from Recalculating.biz with your featured book, I want to tell you about a recent interview I had with Bob Bethel, a turnaround specialist with lots of success in small business. Bob's new book is Strengthen Your Business, Fail-Proof Strategies for Small Business. He tells us of his life successes and failures that have made him and his clients so successful. Over the years, Bob has brought 77 companies back from the brink and changed them into thriving, profitable businesses. His energy is amazing, and at 74, he proves that you can still have a great deal to give others if you just try. His suggestions are easy to understand and very helpful. One insight struck me was that most companies do not have a plan. The old Chinese proverb says, if you don't know where you're going, then any road will take you there, is true today. Bob Beth Bethel's book, Strengthen Your Business, can be found at Amazon.com or can be ordered at your local bookstore. This has been Dan Perkins with your Recalculating.biz featured book. Marcus Limonis, J.D. Powers, and John Scully, and a hundred other presidents and experts contributed to Recalculating the Book. Why did all these people agree to contribute to the book? I'm Don Mazzella, and I'm the editorial director of Small Business Digest. And for 20 years, we have been offering small business leaders information and data to increase profits. Recalculating the book was named the best small business book by the Independent Press Association. Whether you need help with marketing, staffing, finance, operations, technology, or many other subjects. They're all here in recalculating the book. They're now available at Amazon at a reduced cost. We've also created the radio program on recalculating.biz. Dan Perkins here for Recalculating for Small Business with your tip of the day. Should you belong to a local marketing network? One area of potential business is other small business owners through marketing networks. These groups usually meet once or twice a month for lunch and discussions. Sometimes the group will invite a guest speaker to talk about how they are building their brand. People in different businesses generally go and make up these groups. If you have a computer problem, perhaps one of the members of your group can fix your problem or at least tell you about somebody they've used to fix their problems. Sometimes members of your group can use your product or services. So here's your recalculating for small business tip of the day. Reach out and ask your fellow business friends if they belong to a marketing group. And if they do, tell them you'd like to go. Shop around and find a group or two that you like. You'll make new friends and maybe find new customers. 
This is Dan Perkins with your Recalculating Small Business Tip of the Day. My co-host, Dan Perkins, is on assignment, but we have a really special guest on today, Jennifer Fitzpatrick. She's a generations expert, a gerontologist, and author of Cruising Through Caregiving, Reducing the the Stress of Caring for Your loved, Loved Ones. Jennifer, welcome to the program. Thank you so much. You know, um, Jennifer, just today uh, so, uh, someone else with a new book on caregiving, uh, their PR per- person said, why would they want, uh, uh, should they, this author be on uh, this program? And I said, because every small, most small business owners at one time or another was a care- caregiver. And uh, uh, the PR person says, well, uh, she's not going to join us, join you. And I said, gee, w- what a shame. But I'm yeah, so that's glad too you're bad. here. So caregiving impacts everybody, small businesses, big businesses. Uh, and absolutely, it, it definitely impacts business owners. So I'm so delighted to be on your program. Well, uh, and we're delighted to have you because, um, as I say, um, I was a caregiver for both of my parents, and uh, uh, it's both, uh, to me, one of the greatest things you can do, and you, you, and by the way, I learned a great deal about myself and about my parents. You know, we never choose our parents, and, uh, and uh, in childhood, we often have uh, uh, trauma and drama, and it takes us maybe uh, adulthood to realize that, that in the end, they do love us. Uh, uh, yes, yes. And some parents, it can be more challenging than others, but you're right. It's uh, Most of us are, they, we, we will be in a position where we're probably going to have to help take care of not maybe just our parents, but a parent-in-law or an aunt or an uncle or even helping out with, with a close friend who might be going through a treatment or an illness. So, yeah, this is, this is information that everyone can use. Well, uh, tell us about yourself first, what, sure. what you so, do, how you do it. Sure, uh, yeah. So I actually have been working in healthcare since I was uh, a young person in high school, so about 30 years, and I've been in working in one area or another. And um, I in healthcare mostly with senior living and older adult issues. And I it became uh, you know a counselor, a therapist, and I've spent a lot of time with caregivers over the years. And one of the things that I saw caregivers do. People who, you know, whether they have they own a small business, whether they're an executive at a corporation, whether they're a stay-at-home parent, um, we see caregivers burning out all the time. So my goal was to write a book, and that's why I wrote Cruising Through Caregiving, and every chapter is a different way that you can reduce your stress. Because caregiving, you know, opening up a business, running a business is one of the most stressful things that you can do. Uh, Caregiving also is one of the most stressful things that we can undertake as well. And when you're trying to do both, it can feel impossible, but it's not impossible. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, But but now, having said that, uh, let's talk about some of your chapters and some of the things we can do. So the floor is open, so you take it away. Sure. So the first thing you want to realize, especially if you're a business owner, is you cannot do the caregiving by yourself. And I think every expert on caregiving will tell you that. But especially if you're trying to run a business, you need to make sure you have what I call a crew. So a caregiving crew. You want to have... You know, you maybe if it's your spouse or if it's your mom, you might be the primary caregiver, and I call that the captain of the caregiving ship. But you need other people, so you need folks who are your secondary caregivers. So, for example, a secondary caregiver, I liken that to a first mate on a boat. They they're the ones helping you uh, maybe dock the boat or helping you get the boat uh, into shore. So, somebody who's in that secondary caregiver position, maybe if you have an important meeting that you can't miss. Maybe Maybe that person in second position can take your mom to the doctor or they can help your mom, uh, you know, if she can't be alone for a period of time after, say, a surgery. 
uh, they're there for you. They're there for she, for her, her as well as you. And then I say we all need a bunch of tertiary caregivers, and I liken them to like a dockhand on a marina. Uh, folks that are helping you once you get yourself situated, once you dock your boat. Uh, we want lots of those people. And so the dock hands or the tertiary caregivers, somebody like that, they're not going to help take your mom to the doctor. They're not going to give your mom a bath. But what they might do is they might give you a call once a week to see how you're feeling. Uh, maybe you reminisce about old times. They might drop off a lasagna once in a while because they know how busy you are with work and taking care of your loved one. They might, you know, send you, uh, you know, a little care package every once in a while. So those are the the things that someone can do. So friends and family who might be listening to this, and you're not a caregiver. Um, and you know somebody, a colleague or a friend, just any little thing that you can do to support that caregiver, that is something that um, is going to be a really appreciated because it's something that's going to lighten their load a little bit. Could could not agree with you more. But I'm going to now toss you a little curveball and ask you a question. I've seen many families uh, rent a sun, a sunder, husband and wife, uh, during the caregiver period, when uh, um, uh, uh, to me the most important thing is when a husband and wife have a caregiving um, um, situation, how do they work together? Better work together. Can you be more specific? How do they work together? So, are you saying like if it's one of their parents or if it's one of them that's ill? Um, well, let's stick with the parents first. What I've seen is that one uh, one member, usually the the, the wife, has yep. a, a a parent or even an in law parent, yep. which the burden is put on the, that person to take care of, and the hu- husband often almost um, uh, steps aside from from the yep. process. Yeah, that's uh, really me, really. Good. Uh, uh, to me, it's the most common stress thing that, yes. that I have seen. Yeah, you're exactly right. So that's a great point. So more often women are caregiving more than men, but there are, I guess it's about 60-40. So about 60% of caregivers right now are women and 40% are men. So men are catching up, but you're right. Let's say it's your husband's mom and you find yourself in the position – Historically, in the United States and in most cultures, women were the caregivers. Women stayed home. Women took care of the older loved ones. Women took care of the small children. Women didn't have jobs or have careers like they do today. So I think what's really important is that you and your spouse have a really honest, open discussion. For a lot of spouses, this is not hard, and for other spouses, this is extremely hard. So if you're having a hard time saying, look, we both need to be part of this process and we, you know, it can't be just me. Um, we need to look at what are, what is your mom's budget? Uh, you know, really looking at, so for example, like if, if mom say needs around the clock care, it can't be expected that the wife is going to do everything. Maybe it's that they're going to bring in some home care assistance. We look at what mom's budget is. Um, I think spouses have to have really, really open, honest dialogues about if you as a couple are going to help to foot the bill for any of the care, i.e. home care, i.e. nursing home, assisted living, I think you have to have a really honest dialogue about what you can truly afford. So many families, they they just start spending money and hiring help, and they it, they haven't really given it any thought about their, you know, if if, if it's taking away money from their kids, if, you know, to pay for, you know, activities for their school-aged children, or if it's taking money away from retirement, for example. So um, those are the sorts of things that, that I think are really important to have those conversations about. And I I think women especially, men too, but women especially have to remind themselves that you you need not be on the hook. Just because you're a woman does not mean that you have to be the only caregiver in the family. You're right. Uh, But, but you know, you you, you said a word that to me is overused because it's honest discussion. Um, Many couples do not seem to be able to have those 
discussions, whether it's on caregiving or other things. Um, um, I, I do uh, counseling work on it on a totally volunteer basis, and I've run into many, many families where uh, the, the honest discussion simply is not there. It's avoided. Uh, and, you know, um, uh, and I'm just curious how you can, uh, perhaps it's it's beyond the scope of this discussion, but um, I, I, there was just a family down the street where they brought me in to do a, a, a counseling on it because uh, the, they, they were fighting over who was going to take care of the mother. And um, I, I finally had to give up my hands in frustration because no one was talking directly to the subject. Right. They were bringing up things that happened in, in their childhood rather right. than what was there. How do, how do you take care of the parent? That's and and a- there was also the real strain between the husband and the wife of one of the um, uh, families. How do you break through that honesty uh, barrier? Um, uh, I'm asking a question because it's something that over the years has totally frustrated me in this caregiving period. You know, we we in this program have discussed this for the last two years because it's going to be a, a growing issue as our as our uh, population ages, and I, I don't know a solution, and I'm looking for you to kind of help us. So there's not a one size fits all. You're absolutely right. There are people who are never going to have an honest discussion. So I would say a couple things, and for some people they're going to balk. They're going to not do this, but these are things I always recommend if I see that there's there's a breakdown or there just isn't honest communication. I recommend people go to see uh, a counselor or a psychotherapist, go to see their spiritual leader to kind of work through it, talk through it. But, you know, if you're in a marriage where for 30 years or 40 years you really never have had honest dialogue, you may never have that. But what I would say to, to the spouse who is doing most of the work Um, If you really can't have that conversation, set your boundaries. Like, tell your spouse, this is what I'm willing to do, and this is what I'm not willing to do. And be really clear and stick to it. So if you say, you know, I'm willing to take off one day a month to help out your mother, don't be taking off, you know, six days in a month where that's going to impact your business. Or I'm willing, you know, for us to utilize X amount of our budget each month to to provide resources so your mother can stay in in her home. Stick to that. Uh, I think you got to set boundaries. So, so, you know, for some, what we're talking about is very common. It's I'm very fortunate. I have really good communication with my husband. I'm really lucky there. Um, you know, it's not perfect, but I think you're right. There are a lot of families and a lot of relationships where that honest dialogue just doesn't isn't going to happen. And um, so I would say counseling, talking to a spiritual leader, spiritual advisor. But the other thing is, if you want to break those old habits of not communicating well, you have to change. So if you're not happy with the way communication is going with your spouse or if you're trying to talk things through with your siblings about your dad or I think you need to say, here's here's my boundaries. Here's what I can do. Here's what I can afford. Here's what I won't do and stick to it and I I think boundaries are one of the most important things in caregiving, period. We're talking with Jennifer Fitzpatrick. She's written a wonderful new book. Jennifer, the title again and how people can find it. Cruising Through Caregiving, Reducing the Stress of Caring for Your Loved One, and you can get it at Barnes & Noble, Amazon, and uh, actually it's in most libraries all over the country. So cruisingthroughcaregiving.com, you can get a free chapter. Uh, can you say the website again so sure, our, our listeners? Uh, sure, cruisingthroughcaregiving.com. Well, um, it, it's an interesting title, but I've never thought of caregiving as cruising. I've often <laughs> thought of it as an adventure and a voyage. That um, uh, uh, for me, it was it, it was in the end a, a wonderful a wonderful experience. I got to know my parents all over again. But for others, it, it, it's been it, it's been and has been and will be um, a difficult time. Well, I'm, I, I, I'm talking too much only because this subject is so close to me. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I'm glad to hear it. I mean, it's very, very. You know, I'm, I'm glad to hear your experiences. Um, I think we don't people don't talk about it enough. 
Um, one of the reasons we picked Cruising Through Caregiving, the publisher and I, we, we went back and forth about it. Uh, we wanted the title to be provocative, and a lot of people do say that. Well, it's not a cruise. Well, my theory is caregiving is not a vacation, but if you want to, you can reduce your stress. You can cruise more smoothly through the process. So if your stress level, like on a scale of 0 to 10, if your stress level and 0 would be for people who are dead or, you know, really drugged, you know, really drugged up, um, or on a 10 where you can't take another ounce of stress, if you assess that you're at a level 9 or an 8 or a 10, there are things you can do immediately. If you read Cruising Through Caregiving, there are assessments, there's quizzes, and there's strategies that you can implement if you want to change. Now, the other thing that comes up sometimes in caregiving is sometimes people want to be martyrs. Um, they almost take pride in, oh, you know, I'm the only person that does the caregiving, and gosh, poor me. And um, they, you know, they, they push help away sometimes, believe it or not. And a lot of times they don't realize that they're doing that. And so, you know, I call that the martyr syndrome. When somebody gets into that place where they, people might be offering and they just keep pushing them away. Oh, they're not going to do it as well as I do, or they're not going to do it the right way, or mom won't like it if we bring somebody else around. Um, you know, the person who is getting care, it deserves to be part of the conversation, of course. However, um, they can't make declarations like, oh, I will only have you, my daughter, um, it's not fair, you know, and it's not realistic because the daughter is often going to get sick or feel really burnt out if she is doing everything. So we have to be reasonable about that. Well, you're absolutely right. Um, we're, we're talking with Jennifer Fitzpatrick. Jennifer, can you give uh, a couple of things that you think uh, um, some some other suggestions uh, from your book? Sure. So in Cruising Through Caregiving, there's an exercise called the MET exercise, M-E-T. And it's how, so this is for the person that says, there's nobody else. It's just me. Or I'm an only child. There's no one else. There's an exercise called the MET exercise that helps you to identify people in your life that you haven't thought of that maybe you could approach and ask them for help. So business owners will understand this process. Sometimes if you're, like, say you're in a sales slump with business and you're thinking, well, I need to, I need, I need to get more customers, or I need referrals, or I need leads. Um, instead of just kind of waiting for something to happen, a lot of us are going to look at our past customers and reach out to them, or we're going to look at people that we know and say, hey, this is my service. Do you know anybody that might benefit from this? Where We want to do the same thing with caregiving. We want to look at all the people who care about you and all of the people that care about your loved one and you want to let them know that you're caregiving. Remind them. Sometimes, believe it or not, everyone's lives are so busy, people forget. They don't realize maybe how bad it is. Let them know how stressed you are. Say, look, I'm open to help. Um, make a list of all the things that do not require your attention. So maybe grocery shopping is one that's popular. Um, you don't have to do your own grocery shopping. So maybe a neighbor who, when she goes grocery shopping, you give her your list and you give her the money and she picks up your groceries for you. And that's the way that she can contribute to reducing your stress level. So there are people, and if you belong to a faith-based group, a church, a temple, a synagogue, a mosque, what have you, um, they, you have a community there. And often they do provide this type of support to those who are connected to the community. Maybe that's an, an avenue that you can go down. So um, when somebody tells me that there's never anybody else, there's nobody else, I, I tell them that they're wrong. There are other people. You just have to look harder. Yes, and oftentimes they're in the most unexpected places. It's been my That's experience. That's such a good point because often people want to complain, oh, my gosh, my sister does nothing. Well, that might be true. Your sister might be terrible. She doesn't do anything. However, it might be that one of your mother's friends steps up and does some help. So, you know, and it's like you wouldn't even have thought. Like I worked once with somebody whose parent was ill in another city, and when she would fly out to visit and help her, her parent, 
her parents' friends would lend her a car when she flew into town. So that way it saved her money. You know, she would have to pay for the airfare, but she didn't have to pay for a rental car. And so that was a big deal. Like, that was a way that they were contributing. That's the w- a way that they were able to help. Um, it's not that they were, you know, taking mom to the doctor. It's not that they were, you know, feeding mom or dressing mom, but they were offering the use of their vehicle while she was in town, and that, that helped reduce her financial stress. Uh, uh, absolutely. But I'm going to ask another question. Uh, you keep saying mom. But uh, I'm, I'm increasingly seeing that uh, uh, it's oftentimes the widowers, uh, the, the men left without a, a wife, that seem to be in the most need of caregiving. The, are you seeing that, or is it just something that I'm not uh, that I'm just well, uh, overly um, aware of? Statistically, statistically speaking, women are the caregivers more often, and women are the caregivees more often. But, yes, you're absolutely right. Men are caregiving. Men are needing care. Absolutely. We don't want to discount the men. But often I do say mom or wife because more often than not, um, it's, it's the wife that uh, or the mom because women, women tend to, you know, men pass away typically earlier than the women do. So they're living longer. They're needing care more often. Well, let me ask you a different question. Um, in, in this changing uh, society of ours, is neighborhoods, um, the fact that neighbor helping neighbor, is it uh, still as strong or is there seems to be a weakening of the neighborhood bo- bond? I think it depends on the neighborhood. I think it depends on your connection. How close are you to your neighbors? How much do you reach out to your neighbors? How long have you lived in your neighborhood? Uh, Have you invested in relationships in your neighborhood? And so in some neighborhoods, yeah, like there's a really strong uh, desire to help out. And if someone asks you for help, you're going to, you're going to be right there for it or your neighbor might offer it. But in some, it's if you've never reached out or you don't know your neighbor's names, maybe not. So I think it really just depends on the individual community and, and your participation in your community. Well, that's very true. Um, uh, you know, to me, the, the one of the saving graces in my own caregiving experience was the Meals on Wheels and yes. organizations like that. Do you want to comment on that? Uh, sure, absolutely. So what I would say, the best thing for any caregiver listening to do is if you don't know where to start, I want you to go to the website, and I want you to go to N as in Nancy for the number four, a.org. So n4a.org. And that is um, a database where you can find what we call your local area agency on aging. And what that organization offers is it's a, an organization that is funded by the government that will point you in the right direction. Now, they have some services that are free and low cost that will help older adults and their caregivers. But then if, they, if it's not a service that they provide, they can tell you about services, like so they can connect you with your local Meals on Wheels if you don't know how to get in touch with them. So that's the sort of thing that I would recommend. That's the first place that I think everybody should start if they're caregiving. Um, and then if your loved one has any kind of dementia, the other resource I would recommend is you go to the Alzheimer's Association because, again, they can connect you with source resources in your local community, and you want to go to alz.org. You plug in your zip code, and the other thing you can do to get in touch with the Alzheimer's Association is 800-272-3900. That's 800-272-3900, and that's anywhere in the country. Um, you know, you brought up an interesting thing. Um, per- perhaps the, the toughest thing is recognizing that, that – uh, uh, Alzheimer and, and dementia, et cetera, and dealing with it. Do you want to talk a little bit about that in a couple of minutes we have left? Sure. So there's a lot to cover there. Any Anything in particular you want to ask? I'm sorry? I'm sorry. There's so much to cover. Um, uh, did you want to ask a specific question? Because I know we have limited time. Well, to me, what what I've noticed is how difficult it is for uh, for a child to tell a parent uh, uh, in effect, uh, you, you, dementia or Alzheimer's is uh, appearing, 
and uh, uh, I'm going to have to take more and more control of your life. Well, oftentimes we don't necessarily want to tell them that. Um, often, you know, it depends on the stage that the person is is in. Sometimes when the person's in the early stages of dementia, we can have those conversations with our loved one. We can say, look, um, we're concerned about your memory. We want to talk to the doctor. We want to find out what's happening. Because just because you see memory issues does not mean that the person has Alzheimer's. It means, I mean, there could be all sorts of things going on, and some of them can be treated. So I think if the person um, you know, I think having the conversation, let's get your memory checked, let's see what's happening, um, if someone does have a diagnosis, if someone is in those later stages, in the mid-stages, um, I think a lot of adult kids and family members make the mistake of, of arguing with their loved one. Um, you know, Mom, remember, the doctor says you have Alzheimer's. You know, you've got to be careful. You can't drive anymore. And then the, the loved one becomes extremely upset because they don't remember that they've been diagnosed so I think you have to be really cautious, and one of the best things, if you are dealing with a loved one who has Alzheimer's or another type of dementia, what you want to do is try to hook up with the Alzheimer's Association, especially a support group, uh, because you're going to meet people in that support group who have been where you are, who have been dealing with a parent that doesn't realize, or a spouse, or you know, an aunt who, do, who maybe doesn't even realize that they have Alzheimer's. So... Uh, just keep in mind that sometimes you don't want to talk about it too much. You just want to make sure that they're getting taken care of properly. We're talking with Jennifer, Fitzpa uh, uh, Jennifer Fitzpatrick. Jennifer, your, your uh, book, uh, I could talk all, uh, for hours on this subject, but unfortunately we're coming to the end. Um, uh, any last thoughts you want to share with our audience? And uh, uh, tell us your, your website again. And, and sure, the book sure. And so cruisingthroughcaregiving.com, and it, you can download a free chapter, but also Barnes & Noble, Amazon, anywhere books are sold, Cruising Through Caregiving. Um, again, if you have no other idea where to go, you have, you're kind of clueless, you're not sure where to start to ha get help for, for your caregiving situation, go to n4a.org, that's N as in Nancy, number 4a.org, plug in your zip code, and it'll pull up your local area agency on aging, and they can start to point you in the right direction. Uh, Jennifer, uh, thank you so much for uh, thank what you. you're doing. Um, thank you ha for having me on your program. Well, uh, we'll have a link to your website uh, on recalculating.biz tonight where you can hear this and every other past and future program, and you can also tell us of guests you'd like to hear. But uh, Jennifer Fitzpatrick, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Dan Perkins here with your Recalculating Small Business Tip of the Day. Have you ever tried to find someone to help you in a big box store? Your time is valuable, and if you have a question, you need someone to give you an answer. Do you find yourself wandering from aisle to aisle trying to find someone to help you? Finding help is a problem in almost every big box store chain, regardless of what they're selling, TVs, clothes, even nuts and bolts. Greater customer service can differentiate a small business from a big box competitor. When customers can't find someone to help them, they take their frustration out on the store. They are angry. A smart small business owner makes it a point to be attentive, helpful, and polite. May I help you are the sweet words of success. Check out recalculating.biz for more useful small business suggestions. This has been Dan Perkins with your small business tip of the day. Dan's tip of the day should resonate with every small business. Having a bright, clear, physical plan always adds profits. One recent survey revealed 71% of walkers responded that they would enter a newly refurbished establishment even if they didn't have anything to buy or were in the market for buy. So how important is it a small business for physical establishments where customers come in to buy? It's very important. Sprucing up a small business makes sense. Saving cents may cost a small business dollars if the right quality paint is not used. According to hotel association figures, the average time between major spruce-ups for hotels, for member hotels, 
dropped from eight to seven years in the past 12 months. Why? Because new establishments are very important. But don't think these statistics apply only to brick and mortar stores. The entry page for any business is that company's storefront. For those online leaders who think they are immune to the need for change to their storefronts, think again. While changing index pages initially loses visitors, new visitors are usually generated within three months. So today's message, in a physical plant or online, stay new. It will help profits. T- tell me, Dan, uh, tell me about your latest book. My recent or my current book that's coming out, I should say, is uh, Why Can't Grammy Remember Me? And it's uh, it's really the first book written for children between the ages of 9 and 12 and their families uh, dealing with dementia. Dementia is a growing problem with the elderly in the United States and around the world. And we are very well, not very well informed about what's going on, what's happening. So I wrote this book in the form of a mystery. And I have two little girls, 9 and 12, who uh, have the magical power to be able to seem to be able to find things that are lost. And so they go to their dads and moms and they say, you know, we really, we, we, we work all over the neighborhood helping people find things. And we seem to find things. And their dad says, yes, you have a magical talent to do that. And they said, we'd like to start a business to see if we can help other people. So they decided to start a business. The two girls' name are Hudson and Charlotte. And they start H&C's Lost and Found. If you've lost it, we find it. And so they build a business, and they convince the dads to build them an office and a treehouse in the backyard. And uh, they get busy making posters and flyers trying to get customers. And their dads take them downtown, and they put them in the windows and on the telephone poles and light poles. And they go home, and uh, first week goes by, and nobody comes. And the second week and third week, and nobody comes. They're really, really dejected. And the fourth week comes, and... There's a dock at the door, and they walk over and open the door, and there's a young man standing there with one of their flyers in his hands. And he says to them, my dad says the reason why my Grammy can't remember me is because she's lost her memory. And your flyer says you find things that are lost. Can you find my Grammy's memory? Well, they don't know anything about memory, so they take his name and they go see their dads to see what can happen And the story evolves into how they learn about what dementia is and what's going on in the body when somebody has dementia. And then they decide, while they can't find their customer's memory, they can help him build the tools to retain her in his memory. And so at the end of the book, there are about 10 10 to 12, 13 things that families can do together to work on to preserve the memory of grandma and grandpa so the generations can know who these people were. And that's the story. What a great book. And when will it be available? And and how can people get it? Well, it'll be available on Amazon.com. A lot of people who have read it, uh, who've had moms and dads that have been stricken with Alzheimer's and dementia, uh, tell me that they really now begin to understand what's happening in grandma's brain. And uh, we took a a different approach. Rather than do the typical brain cross-section, we design, I work with the artist, and we design highways in the brain. And there's a brain of one of the little girls and the brain of Grammy. They both have highways, roads, but the the girl's brain, everything is green and go. Grammy's brain is full of no left turns, do not enter, stop, no right turns. So all of the messages that need to come from our brain get screwed up and we can't function. Great illustrations, though. Wonderful illustrations. Well, say goodbye, Dan. All right. Time for us to go. Thank you for joining us. And by the way, if you didn't hear all of today's show, you can go to recalculating.biz and you can pick up this show and past shows uh, to expand your knowledge as becoming more successful entrepreneurs. Thank Thank you for joining us. 
and we'll talk to you next week. Thank you for joining us on Recalculating. We hope the information you received on today's episode was helpful to you in starting and growing your business. Please go to our website, recalculating.biz, to contact us, to listen to past shows, and see special offers. Until next time, remember, if you grow, we grow. Join us next week for more helpful ideas to make your business a great success. Recalculating, a program designed to help you be successful 